Welcome to episode one of the AE Juice Premiere Pro course. I'm Chris, and throughout this series, I'm going to be talking about Premiere Pro, what the program has to offer, how you can edit your footage, export, and a bunch of other topics that are going to help you create an amazing video. Now, before we jump into Premiere Pro, it's really important that we have the right footage because if you spend time shooting the correct footage, it's going to make your life inside of Premiere Pro easy because you're not going to have to fix bad footage. So I'm just going to spend this first episode just focusing on how to shoot great video using your camera and lighting. So let's begin with the camera. It doesn't matter what camera you're using. It could be a professional camera. It could be an iPhone or somewhere in between. The only thing that matters is the ability to change the manual settings. If your camera is in an automatic mode, then it might be shooting in a weird frame rate, a weird shutter speed, and it might make your footage look a bit weird. So it's really important that regardless of what you're using, you have the ability to change the manual settings. If you're filming on your phone, then that's completely fine. Just avoid using the default app because this is just an automatic mode. Go and download an advanced camera app where you can control the shutter speed, the aperture, the white balance, and all of these other settings because this will make your life so much easier. So now that you've got your camera into a manual mode, it's really important that you understand what all of these different numbers and settings correlate to and how they're going to affect your image. So I'm just gonna spend a second talking about all of these different numbers and what they mean. First up is the shutter speed and the shutter speed on your camera looks like one over 50, one over 100, one over 200. Essentially the shutter speed is going to affect your motion blur. So if you have a smaller shutter speed, so one over 20, there's going to be a lot more motion blur than if you had this set to one over 100. Now the number, the shutter speed number, that correlates to the amount of times the shutter is going to open and close every second of video. So if you have it set to one over 25, one slash 25, then it means the shutter is going to open and close 25 times per one second of video. So this means if you're shooting at a really high shutter speed of one over a thousand, it means the shutter speed will open and close 1000 times in one second. Generally though, the golden rule with the shutter speed is you want to keep this double the frame rate. So your typical frame rate is 25 and this means your shutter is going to be one over 50. Of course, the rule changes if you're shooting slow motion because your frame rate will increase and this means your shutter speed will also increase. But as a general rule of thumb, if you're shooting real time video, your shutter speed is going to be one over 50. Next up, we'll talk about frame rate considering we've already mentioned it. So your frame rate is referring to your frames per second, your FPS. And this is basically how many stills for one second of video. So video is made up of loads of images and in one second of video, if you're shooting in 25 frames per second, that means there's 25 still images that are filmed and captured to make that one second of video. Now 25 frames per second is one of the default settings for real time video. You also have 23.976 and 30. So if you're shooting real time video, if you're shooting an interview of somebody or somebody talking or just real time footage that you don't need to slow down, you're going to be shooting in 25 frames per second. But if you plan on shooting slow motion, it's really important that you pull your shutter speed up to a higher number. So the first slow motion number that you're going to see is 50 FPS or 60 FPS. So if you're shooting at 50 or 60, this means you can slow your footage down to 50% in the edit. Like I mentioned before though, when you increase your frame rate, you have to increase your shutter. So if your frame rate is now 50, your shutter will be one over 100. Now moving on, we've got the aperture and the aperture is basically controlling the amount of light that comes into the sensor. And it's also controlling how blurry the background is going to be. So the aperture is just a hole in your lens that opens and closes to let light into the camera sensor. So if you have a really small opening on the aperture, this is not going to let loads of light in. So your image is going to be a lot darker. But if you open that up, then it's going to let a lot of light in. And this means you're going to have a brighter image. Now, as well as controlling the amount of light that gets into the camera sensor, the aperture also controls the amount of the frame that is in focus. So if you have an aperture of around F22, which is a closed aperture, everything is going to be in focus. But if you have an aperture of F2.8, which is really wide open, then if you focus on somebody in the foreground, your background is more than likely going to blur. So if you're looking for that really nice blurry background effect, you want your aperture to be low. So have your aperture at around F2.8, F1.8, F4, somewhere around there, you're gonna get that nice blurry background. Now the next setting that you're probably going to see is ISO. 
ISO is basically just a brightness control. And the ISO doesn't really change anything on the camera. ISO is basically just a digital brightening tool. So if you increase the ISO, so ISO 100, ISO 1000, ISO 10,000, the higher you go, the brighter the image will be. But the problem is with the ISO is it is a digital brightening tool, which means that the more you increase the brightness on the ISO, the more you're going to introduce digital noise into the frame. So try and avoid pulling the ISO higher than it needs to be. Focus on balancing the frame rate, the shutter speed and the aperture to get all of the light into the sensor. Different cameras have different native ISOs and this means this is the number that the camera likes to be set to. So this camera that I'm shooting on has a native ISO of 800. If I take this much higher than 800, then the image starts to look a little bit ugly and a little bit amateur. So try and find out what camera you're shooting on and try to find out what the native ISO of that camera is and try and stick to that number. If your image is too dark, then try adding light into the scene rather than cranking up the ISO. Next up, we're going to talk about color balance and color balance is basically just the color of your scene. So you'll notice in different environments and at different times of the day, you'll have different color temperature. So if you're inside in a warm environment, this is going to be warmer and this is going to be represented by a number. Now, typically a warmer environment is somewhere around 3200 Kelvins and a colder environment like the middle of the day is going to be 5,500 Kelvins. So generally warmer is a lower number, cooler is a higher number, and you really want to match the color balance on your camera to the color of the light in the scene. So if you're shooting outside and it's a sunny day, set your white balance on your camera to 5,500. But if you're filming inside, it's dark, there's tungsten lights on, you're going to want to set your color balance to 3,200. It's also really important that when you're using multiple cameras that you set the color balance the exact same number on every camera that you're using because that way your color will match. And then the last feature that you're going to need to know about on your camera is your frame size. So you might have the option to shoot 720, 1080, 2K, 4K, 6K, 8K. This is basically just referring to the amount of pixels in your image. So essentially the larger the number, the more detail and the more information you're going to get in your image. Now people typically think the more definition that you have, the higher the number. So if I shoot 8K over HD, it will instantly look a million times better, but that's simply not the case. Focus on building the light and adjusting your aperture, your shutter speed and your frame rate to get a really nice image. The frame size is just referring to the amount of detail within the frame. So there's no real benefit between shooting 1080p and 4K other than the fact that you can do some digital effects with a larger frame size in the edit. So now that you understand your camera, it's also really important to understand a few basic cinematography rules in order to capture good video. Now, as a general rule of thumb, you want to keep your camera as steady as possible. Now there's many ways of doing this. You could put this on a tripod, you could put this on a shoulder rig, or you could use a gimbal or a glide cam to get really smooth tracking shots. I would arguably say though that lighting is the most important thing when it comes to video. If you have bad lighting, then your video, it doesn't matter what camera you have, your video will look bad. And the same thing applies for great lighting. If you spend time to craft your lighting and it looks great, then even an iPhone will look incredible, whereas a great camera will look awful in bad lighting. So really focus on your lighting when it comes to video to improve the look of your work. Now, as a general rule of thumb, I typically recommend the three point lighting setup to people when they're asking about filmmaking. And that's because the three point lighting setup looks great and it's super easy to do. So essentially three point lighting, as you probably would have guessed, consists of three lights. You have one light over here, one light over there, and then one light behind. So let's start with our key light. This is our first light. This is just a large light source just off camera and this is going to give us a really nice look on our subject. Then we're going to complement that with a fill light. This is our second light that's on the other side of the camera. And this is just going to fill in any shadows that the key light might have created. And then lastly, we have a light behind, which is the backlight or the hair light. And the purpose of the backlight is to shine light onto the back of the subject and create separation between the subject and the background. So implementing a three point lighting setup into your video is going to make your videos look much more professional. Of course, though, it's always really important that you have the correct type of lighting. There are hard lights and there are soft lights. And typically, if you're looking for that really nice, beautiful light, you're going to want to focus on soft lighting. So an example of soft lighting is a softbox, and an example of hard lighting is a harsh redhead video light. 
In another example, the clouds are soft lighting and direct sun is harsh lighting. If you look at somebody on a cloudy day, their skin looks really soft and diffused. Whereas when you look at them on a harsh sunny day, there's harsh shadows and this is typically seen to be less flattering. So try to adopt that policy when it comes to lighting. Try and focus on softer light sources rather than harsh light sources. And then of course you want to pay very close attention to your audio but we're going to spend an entire episode talking about audio later on in the series. So now that you understand how your camera works and the best settings to use, how to operate your camera and how to create beautiful lighting, we can now shoot our footage and get that imported into Adobe Premiere Pro. So in the next video, I'm going to show you how to import and organize your footage into Adobe Premiere Pro and we'll start to delve deep into the world of Adobe.